Uh, thanks for coming along and um, listening to me today. So I'm, I'm, I'm a farmer, I'm not actually a presenter. I just present sometimes, so the good thing about me being a farmer is you guys can challenge me the whole way through. If I've only got an idea, I might not have the right answer. So you're allowed to stick it to me if you think I'm wrong. So um, these are my parents, Ian and Colin Taylor. Uh, they're both from Northland. My father's a third generation farmer and my mother's a fifth generation farmer. They met at the local rugby club. My uh, father played for the seniors and my mother's best friend was the coach's daughter. So they met at the local rugby club. Uh, they got married in the local church and after they um, got married they went sheer walking just north of Whangarei. So they, um, they went sheer walking just north of Whangarei on a 400 cow dairy <coughs> farm. And they were there for six years before they bought their first farm. So they sold 200 cows for uh, 150 bucks each. And that $30,000 was the deposit on their first farm, which cost $60,000. That was 1981. And uh, uh, that's where they, that's where I grew up with my, um, with my family. So I'm the youngest of three, I've got two older sisters. And as I was growing up in that community, I was part of a community that uh, worked together and lived together, so we'd help each other out on farms, pick up hay together, uh, social events would be with our local community, and the people in our community became our mentors and coaches. And into that, into that farming operation would bring young people, young men, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds, straight out of school, and they'd be in our house and part of our family. And my parents would help them develop and grow, and our community would also help them develop and grow. So I kind of took that kind of philosophy and thinking for the rest of my working life. I'll interrupt, just skip to the next one. Yeah. yeah, here you go. Here's a picture of me and my family. On the one with the really nice the <laughs> um, so it's uh, yeah, it's a great place to grow up in rural New Zealand, and a great place to bring up a family, and a great place to grow all together. So this is a photo of my parents a couple of years ago. So my father passed away 18 months ago, and at his funeral, there was about 300 odd people came along, and people that used to work for him stood up and said, uh, if it wasn't for these people. I wouldn't be the person I was today. If, he had, if these people hadn't helped me, I wouldn't have learnt these things, I wouldn't have my own property. Uh, and it's that kind of philosophy that I took to my farming career. Oh, sorry, so just to sum up, sum up what we used to have. So it was a developing country, so for the last 800 years, we've been trying to develop New Zealand. And the rest of New Zealand was completely behind us as an agricultural community. And we used to have math people out scientists helping us out on farm, working with farmers to try and create new ideas and innovations. And remember, it's the new ideas and innovations, and innovations that made us wealthy. The working hard bit was just to get it to market. We've kind of forgotten about that in the last 20 years. It's not just about working hard, it actually needs an idea and innovation to start with. Uh, so a farm was, you are in control of your farm. There was no RMA law, there was no employment law. I used to joke with my father, you know, it was easy for him. He could do anything he wanted, drain a swamp, tell the staff to piss off. <laughs> really strong rural communities that work together. And a real strong belief around if you work hard for 10 years, you'd buy your own farm. And that was the strategy for employing, attracting high quality people into agriculture. A real belief around owning your own farm one day. And once you had that own you owned that farm, then you were in control of that farm. That was your piece of the world for you and your family. And the average uh, number of cows was under 150 per farm, and a 100 hectare odd dry stock block was still commercially viable. And also the people that worked on your farm were a part of your family, and they were a part of your community. So, it's not gonna work again, so I'm gonna do the next one. Uh, so, I kind of, this is the image I had uh, when I, I went to work for Jody Wallace, and then down to the Rangatiki. This kind of happy, 
group of people working together, <coughs> making a life for themselves, and enjoying the people they work with. But in reality, what I had was complaints, arguments, stress, fist fights on the yard, people getting knocked out, things like that. Another time, a couple of dairy assistants still would be a really good idea if they took two of the farm bikes to the pub. And they got, would have got away with it, but on the way home, the guy that was behind the first guy thought it'd be really funny if he drove up fast behind him and then at the last minute swerved and go past him. But he didn't quite get it right, he just ran up the back of the other one. So they both crashed, the ambulance got called, the police turned up, I was there milking the cows, wondering where everyone was, and the policeman comes in and talks to me. So it was, so it was that kind of tension that I was, I was ex, uh, that was existing in the, in the farms that I was running and the people that I was running. And I guess uh, one thing that really hit me was, uh, it was probably late spring on the dairy farm. I was having a staff meeting and I looked around the room. So I'd employed these beautiful young people about three or four months ago. And I looked around the room and they were tired and covered in cow shit. <coughs> uh, the guys were all unshaven. So I kind of turned these beautiful young people that I promised a life into these zombies in about three months. And I was starting to suspect that what I was doing wasn't really working anymore, that it wasn't just quite right. And when I started advertising for new people after the good people left, because I keep losing the good people, because they have options, they go somewhere else, this guy would turn up. <laughs> so I go, I don't need this guy, I'll, I'll advertise again. And then this guy would turn up. <laughs> So, so what's changed? What had happened since the 90s, 80s? Why weren't we attracting high quality people into agriculture anymore? So I started to ask a few questions, try to talk to some of the farmers and the people on the farm. And what I, what I found out that farming systems had intensified. So my father was a great farmer, but when he left the cow shed after milking in the morning, he just let the cows wander back to the paddock. He just went home for breakfast and then came back later on if he wanted to watch the cricket, he'd watch the cricket. If he needed to go to something, he'd go to something. He was a, he was a hard worker and an intense farmer, but the intensity of the day is quite different. You know, on dry stock farms, you've got winter, winter crops and plantain crops on the hills to finish lambs. So the intensity of our farming systems and the skills required to run them have increased dramatically since the 80s, or even the 60s or 70s. Uh, people no longer believe they could work really hard to buy their own farm one day. And you can kind of argue that it's because they spend too much money or they don't work hard enough, or whatever it is. It's kind of, um, it's the belief that used to attract high quality people. And if they don't believe it anymore, we don't have a strategy for uh, attracting high quality people. They've got choices today, lots of choices. Uh, social change had changed expectations around how we employ people. So if I'm in a barbecue and I'm feeling a bit cheeky, I'll, I'll talk to a baby boomer and I'll go, oh, farming was easy in your day. And you'll go, oh, why, why's that? You've got tractors and this stuff and that stuff. I'll go, well, it was easy for you. Your wife did everything for you. She cooked, she cleaned, she looked out to the kids, she did the books, she washed all your clothes. All you had to do was work and go to the golf club or the Lions or something. It's even better if the wife's sitting next to him. <laughs> and he's like, right, I want to get you, but then he's looking at his wife and she's staring him down like, I dare you to deny that. <laughs> so, so it's a bit of a joke, but it's a way to describe social change. So my wife doesn't want to do that for me. She wants her own career. Uh, she wants me to look after the kids as well. She wants me to help out at home. So there's been quite a shift in expectation. So if we try and employ people like we used to, employ people, then the person you employ, if it's a male, uh, he's going to be caught between his wife and his employer. And he's going to choose his wife and his kids and go somewhere else. And then go work for Beef and Lamb or Dear NZ or BNZ or something like that. Because it's, it's those high quality people that we're trying to attract into agriculture. And that's what those people can do. They've got choice. Uh, I guess the other thing that I realise is that New Zealand wants us to act a lot differently. So in the past, we, if things got a bit tight, or uh, we were a bit rough, no one would care, you know? 
if we maybe didn't look after our cows as well as we were supposed to, or we didn't shift that effluent spreader. Actually, we didn't have effluent spreaders then. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so there's an intensity in farming, and there's also a higher expectation to be consistent over a long period of time. You can't kind of let it slip if you're getting busy or something's happening. So the other, that kind of got me going with the questions, and then I started to just drill down a bit deeper around what actually people want. So any thoughts from the audience? What do people want? Time. What's that? Time. Time? Job security. Job security. Yep. Work life balance. Yep. Appreciation. Yep. Pathway. Wealth. Pathway. Pathway. Nice. Build wealth. Build wealth. Yep, some people do. Yep. So these are the main things that I found when I talk to people. So they want to work with good people. So they don't have to be friends with the person they're working with. They just want to respect the person they're working with. So if they don't like the person or they don't like the team, they're going to go somewhere else. They actually only want average market rates of pay. A lot of people say, oh, they want lots of money, but what they want is to go to the pub and go, oh, I'm getting paid the same as my mate over here is doing a similar job. So you kind of have to find out what market rate for pay for that person is in your community. And they want flexibility to do really important things. A lot of people say, oh, people don't want to work today. But uh, young people actually want to work, but they want to be able to have the flexibility to do important things. And if I expand on that a bit more, so when we had small rural communities, you could actually work in the morning, go to the wedding or whatever is really important in your social group, because your social group was within a half an hour drive. You could actually work, go to something, come back to work and then finish off. So I remember going to my father's, with my father to the rugby club. We'd watch the rugby, we'd go home and milk, and then we'd go back to the rugby club. So today when you socialise in your group, you often go somewhere else. Because our group spread around New Zealand and sometimes the world. Uh, and the other thing they want is help towards their dreams. And I used to think it was everyone wanted to own a farm like me. But when I actually started talking to these guys, it's different things for different people. So for some people it's a house, or for some people it's just I need to get my kids through high school and university. It's, it's something different to each person, so you have to sit down and find out what that person actually wants. Disappear. You're getting the abbreviated version today. So we'll take that as an opportunity to ask me more questions. So how do you draw out of them uh, what their dreams are? We have to build a relationship with them. And then it's, that's just up to your style. Whether you do it when you're fencing with them, or you actually have a sit down meeting with them every once a month, like a 20 minute, how's it going, what's happening. It'll take a little while to build trust and actually drill down to find out what they want. Because they'll kind of give you like the answers that you think. Like, oh yeah, I want to have a farm one day. And you go, no, really, what do you want? Like, what does your family want? Sometimes they have to go away and come back. Because they, they won't actually know. So you kind of have to help them by asking them open questions. And if they give you one line, it's just say, no, no, what do you want? Stu, do you think um, <clears throat> um, geographically distant sheep and beef farms have different issues from Dairy farms that are in a local, more in a localised area because of the terrain and what have you, closer perhaps to um, civilisation. Um, do you think there are different effects with that? When, I, when I've presented to dairy farmers, they've said the same thing. <laughs> My farm's special because I'm isolated or something. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's kind of true to a degree, but what you've got to go is into your community and find out, find out the people, the good productive people in your community that you want to work on your farm, and then try and work out a way that their life will suit working on their farm. So it might be just between nine and three, or it might be just mornings until they do something else, or it might just be Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays. So the, so the key limiting factor in our rural communities is high quality people. And by high quality, I mean they're consistent with their life. You know, they don't have dramas or whatever. You've heard those dramas. <laughs> and, and they have the ability to learn and communicate. So if they've got an issue, they'll sort it out with you. 
that's a high quality person in rural New Zealand. So you find those people, and then you try and work out whether there's any win-wins around how those people can work on your on your property. I'm just wondering, um, what's the best way to establish a market rate of payers? Market rate of payers, it's about talking to people in the community. So I just started talking to people. So the coach of one of the hockey teams, he um, has a van driving business. So I said, what, what do you pay people? He said, 18 bucks for an average guy and 20 bucks for a better than average guy. That was, so I'm working out the market. So in your area, you know, what's the fence to get paid or the contract to get paid? Or whoever's in your community. How do you work through that flexibility? You've obviously got, you've got to work weekends and all the rest yeah. of the rock and rosters and stuff like that. You know, it's fine to have flexibility, but last minute it can be a real pain. Oh, no, it can't be last minute. So flexibility is planned. <coughs> planned ability to take time off. That's what I mean by flexibility. And it's not about lose wins. So it's, you've still got to run a business. But it's, it's looking for those win-wins. So it's got a win for him or her. And it's got a win for you and your business. And, and it's got to be planned. So we run rosters for months, for a month, so you can, so you know who's on and who's off. Yep. Awesome. We wait. Maybe. So where were we? What do people want now? Help towards the aims and dreams. Yep. Uh, and so here's some of the things I changed on farm. So find out what they want and help them get there. So there's a, there's a young guy that had just left school, 16. He got kicked out of school. Been working for me on the dairy farms for a little while, but what he really wanted to be was a contractor. So we sat down and talked to him, talked him through starting a company, and taught him how to do provisional tax and GST. He has a, and then he'll buy part of the tractor, and then he'll buy the whole tractor. So it's about finding a win-win situation. So I've retained a high-quality person, and I'm helping him to get to his dreams. And in the meantime, we've got a motivated staff member. Uh, Win-wins with people, so uh, one thing I noticed when I talked to the couples was the wife was at home with the kids, or the partner was at home with the kids, and she was actually getting really depressed because she had a career and a life, and now she married some farmer and she's stuck in the house. So, um, so we set up these job sharing situations with those couples. So one of them will work from five till 10, and then the other one will work from 10 to six. So they both get kid time, they both get adult time and they get a big income without one person being tied all the time. Uh, so it's a competitive market for people, high quality people, in rural New Zealand, and in all, all New Zealand really. If you talk to the well driller and he needs people, or the mechanic, the engineer, everyone needs high quality people in New Zealand. And I've gone over what a high quality person was. So how do you stand out in your business? So that's part of the reason we do five and two rosters, because I'm beating the market. Other dairy farmers don't do that. And the reason I talk to, to days like this is putting it out there. So I'm advertising. It's a strategy to attract high quality pe people to our business. Uh, get the right people on the bus. So I started doing all these good things, and then the bad people started taking advantage of it. So that was the, the second step to what I had to learn. So for doing all these good things, the standard has to be higher. So I have to get the poor people off. Because poor people will run right. So there's, there's two parts of it. You've got to be good, but then you've got to be tough. And my catchphrase that I came up with was good, productive people. You've got to be a good person, and you've got to be productive. So I don't want really good people that do nothing, because they're a pain in the ass. And I don't want really productive people that are assholes, because they're also just as much a pain in the ass. So it's a catchphrase. I just want you to be a good person and productive, and that's how we <coughs> and that's how we uh, vet the people that come into our teams. Still on that? Yep. I'm looking around and saying how many from my team here, but I've, I guess we all fit into different demographics. But you <coughs> and I were both aged between 16 and 24 when we were young men at yep. that point in time, and our priorities then were quite different. We like sometimes we went from Friday night to Saturday night to Thursday night to Friday, that sort of thing. So I guess, you know, if we're looking at a big part of our potential from the pool, which is young guys who don't necessarily think too deeply about a whole bunch of stuff, 
how do you work through what you've just said in terms of the goals and objectives and whether they're good people or not so that you So productivity is easier. Do you do stuff? And have you got skills? And to define to those guys what a good person is, you want to hang around with that person. You want to be around them. Is he a person you want to be in the team? That's that's how I simplify good productive. Productive, you do things, and you're not mucking around, and good, you want to hang out with that person. Yeah? And I think there's another part of that question is around their aims and goals, eh? So their aims and goals might be to socialise with their mates and find a partner. Because that's kind of what they're doing at that age, eh? Yep. With other people, they've got kids, so it's like they want to spend time to coach their rugby team on Saturday or hockey team or whatever it is. So it's really about asking the questions until you actually find out what they want. And they've all got valid needs for that person. But only back the people that are good and productive. If they're not good and productive, you need to get exit them out of the team. So taking a step back to yep. when you want to get one of these good productive people. Yep. Um, so how, I mean, a normal situation is that you advertise a job, you have a bunch of people that you've never met before apply, and you interview them, and then you select based on a two-hour conversation and a little yeah. sample of which one yeah. is you think. Yeah, it's a bollocks process, isn't it? Um, so <laughs> how can you, you know, I guess, improve that to, you know, I mean, later down the track, you yeah. can do all this stuff to get the best out of them, but how can you best one for doing this? So if you're, if you're really strong on this stuff and you explain it to your team, they'll actually vet the people coming in. So actually it was a conversation I had yesterday with one of the dairy assistants. He said, I've got a lot of mates that want to work here, but I know they won't succeed. Because he really understands what's required to be part of this team. And those guys only bring in the guys that are going to work. They protect the culture and the place because they enjoy it. And they only let the good people in. So that's part of it, but that takes a while. So the other part of it is, I do all that phone calling stuff and reference stuff. And on the very first interview, I go, I'm not going to ask you anything today. All I'm going to do is present to you how we, how we farm and how we expect you to behave. And I want you to ask me questions. And at the end, I'm going to give you two days to, to think about it and then bring me back if you want to be part of our team. So, so it's quite a different way of doing it. So I kind of lead in by saying, Usually uh, I ask you questions and you try and answer it the, the way that you think that I want it answered and I'll try and do the same and then we'll try and get a long term relationship from half lying to each other. <laughs> yeah. Which is a tr that's the normal process, eh? Yeah. So I'm saying this is how we expect you to behave, this is how we uh, expect you to farm and this is what we're going to pay you. I'm going to present to you how our farm works. You, come, you decide whether you want to be part of us or not. So that cuts through all that crap. That conversation, what sort of detail are you going into at that initial stage? Well, it, then I'm just talking about our farm systems and behaviour expectations. So th this is another thing I realised, that it's really hard to performance manage people out under the employment law that we've got. It's really difficult, but it's a lot easier to behaviour manage them out because it's serious misconduct when they don't behave correctly. And also, the social group, the pressure when people aren't behaving to an expected cultural standard they leave, they either leave, or they get dismissed through serious misconduct. So we don't dismiss anyone for, uh, for performance issues now. It's only ever behaviour. Yeah. What, what if as an industry, go, you know, if we think about beef and lamb, what yep. industry, what do we then do with those people? I mean, we talk about this from a business responsibility. But, you know, this is an easy thing to talk so, so, yeah, so you got. So this is the point here. You've got to understand your culture and how you expect people to behave. So my expectation is going to be different to another farmer down the road. He might be happy with that behaviour. She might be happy with that behaviour because they've got different drivers. This is about understanding what you require from your people and then getting a team to, to fit it. Does that answer your question? Sort of, sort of in a different way. You kind of said all the people that are no longer viable for the industry, what do we do with them? Oh, I look, I was just saying, yeah. you're all engineer of bad people. Yep. But, but you look at you, you know, some of them will go to other farms. Yeah, so some of them will go to other farms that that behaviour and the way they want to work will suit that particular farm. The key is that you understand what you require from your people. 
And how do you know that? Whenever, whenever you think, I can't believe that guy's done that, that's an unwritten cultural, cultural um, uh, aspect of what, what you think you should behave on your property. Whenever you think, why the hell did that guy do that? That's when you need to write it down. Because they're thinking, this is how you do it on a farm. Because believe it or not, every farm is different. I don't know if you've noticed that. But they've all probably got different yeah, expectations. So um, how are we off for time? I'll run through this stuff and come back to the video if we've got more time. So, um, so New Zealand's the greatest, uh, farming's the greatest job in New Zealand. Why do we make it so hard? Any thoughts? It's your industry, not ours. It's mundane. <laughs> no, it's better than that. You're out there outdoors. It's a challenging job. In a shed, with a big motor going out. I oh, know, so, so in dairy farming, we, um, I'm talking about agriculture. So just to answer that question a little bit, we don't, we don't, um, we have a real flat structure on our team. So everyone rotates between roles. So everyone milks. So we've got eight people on a thousand cow farm. So you might milk a couple of times, um, or maybe uh, four or five times a week. So we share that role to get out of that kind of situation. So if you're like sheep and beef is the greatest job in the world, and deer, why do we make it so hard? So we, so we make it hard because of our history. It's a habit. Because we were breaking in this country over the last 800 years. So our forebears, my grandparents, they had to be really tough people. Because that's the way you survived in New Zealand agriculture. We were breaking in a new land. And that's how we tested people coming into agriculture. We kind of tested them to see if they're hard enough to go through. But we don't actually have to be hard like that anymore. We've kind of developed this country, pretty much. So we need a different type of person, and a different type, type of person to be successful in New Zealand agriculture today. So we don't have to test them to see if they break. We can actually create a situation where really good productive people succeed, whether they're males or females, young or old. Any thoughts on that? So it's a competitive market for good people in New Zealand. We all know that. So what are you going to do on your farm to change, to attract high quality people? Another one is change is being forced on you. What are you going to do? Has it changed? It's quite different now. Everyone I talk to feels the change. Whether it's generational change, or change from the rest of New Zealand forcing things on us, whether it's the bank change, whether it's the change around um, the value of properties. We've kind of extracted the, the productive potential out of our properties over the last 150 odd years. And each generation has been able to take that equity away because we've gone from here to here. So we've got to a point now where we've reached the biological potential for the value of our properties. So we don't have the ability to take that equity out each, each generation now. So now we're in a conflict between the generation that's about to take over and the one that wants to exit and take the equity away. That's changed. The way the banks behave, it's changed. And it's only going to change faster. So, um, any other questions here? So the margins, then, um, you know, obviously the Technology change, there's no more efficiencies to economically get out of farming, whatever industry it is in New Zealand. Well, it's too long going back to when you had your broken team sitting there. Yeah. How, how long did it take to change for your perception of you? You know, if you're going to how long, to time, how long did it take to change me? Yeah, about about 10 them. years. Yeah. 10 years of hard, hard work. Yeah. 10 years of getting it right. Steve, what's done financially for the business? 
So, uh, like, that's always a hard one to Evaluate. determine that because yeah. there's so many multiple factors on profitability. Yeah. So there's um, so I'm, so I'm paying everyone uh, more per hour, and it's the same cost per production milk solid. So that's a bit of a financial indication. So we have less damaged vehicles, we have uh, better production, better productivity, and I spend a lot less time trying to solve conflict issues, whether that's within a team or in their private life. So that's a bit of a description of productivity. I enjoy farming now. I was hating farming when I had the teams like that. And I enjoy being with those people now. I don't socialise with them, but it's nice to be around them. So there's a couple of indicators there around. But, so another thing with um, changing the way you employ people, uh, it takes two or three years, four years to set it up before it really starts to perform. Probably started this process about four years ago, and it's only in the last six months that it's really starting to get momentum. So it's a short-term cost for a long-term gain. There's a couple of other indicators that, of success, like uh, when I used to advertise for managers, I'd, I'd kind of pick from the worst guy and go, oh, he's not so bad, that guy. But the last time I advertised, I probably had five or six good people I could pick from. And in a competitive market, that's a pretty good indicator. <coughs> what is it? How often would you have a beer with your staff? On farm, I don't have a beer at all. We have uh, Christmas dues off farm, but we've got this policy of no drinking on farm. It's part of our health and safety policy. It's a different way to socialise with people now, eh? Because there's a whole need for professionalism in farming. And remember, I've got 30 people I'm looking after, so I have to be extra careful. So I don't, I don't drink on farm with the guys. So you take a lollipop? Hey, for for um, the social events, we either go to the golf club or into the local pub. We um, socialise at those events off farm. And then it's quite distinct, eh? really distinct boundaries. You can get away with that stuff on a smaller farm with a smaller team because you're able to manage those situations. How then does that compare to what you referred to when you were growing up in your community? And do you, you know, is that going to... Um children therefore have different experiences, do you think? Is that going to be something that, is that a good thing or a bad thing or something? So, um, so the key stuff I took out of my childhood was, as a community, we're working together to help each other get to a better place. And that's what we're doing as a group of people out there. We're working together to help each other out, to get what we need out of life. And the other part of the question is, what's that going to be like for our children? It's going to be really different. But it's going to be really different for our children anyway. 20 years time, farming is going to be really different. The key things are tied to the things that you love about farming to get them out into those situations. So, any other thoughts here? Um, just that the longevity of people, how long they stay, yep. and what is your success rate of that you um, move them up through roles from going into management? Yep. Or you prefer to bring in so, um, so yeah, some of the teams are really stable, and there's been no changes for a couple of years. Other, the, other, one of the other teams has changed managers, so then you get a change in team behind that. Uh, so we're getting a lot of success around retaining high quality people. We run a flat structure and rotate roles every six weeks, and by doing that, you, uh, one person's not getting stuck just milking cows. You're getting uh, different roles, pastures, machinery, cropping, so you're ro rotating those teams around. And by doing that, you're getting su succession in roles as well. And what we're finding now is people are coming up through the ranks and then they're becoming the second person on the farm and then going off and managing farms around in the community. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And if we can get the whole of New Zealand agriculture doing that, then we've just got a huge wealth of development in the next, in the next generations of farmers. Do you find them um, uh, off farm training courses good? Or um, like, like in New Zealand, for instance, um, you've seen the staff on yep. on training. Yeah, training is a huge motivator, and it's a it's a really cheap way to pay people to.
to advance. It, they, they take a lot from it, they really love it. And then you just got to set up the training in relation to the person. And whether it's skills training like ITO, or it's uh, personal development training like having a coach approach with a coach, or um, learning skills around how to manage yourself. Yeah, because the role is you've got to manage yourself before you manage other people. Eh? So, skills development, and also teams development as a team as well. Personality test the whole team, so they understand each other better, and then set up roles around behaviour and a way to communicate, give people feedback. They're all skills that are really important on folks. Do you regularly sort of um, just gauge goals that, goals that you set with your staff and how successful you are and actually achieving those goals or what? Uh, yeah, so we just yeah, finished we finished a bit of strategy document the last couple of weeks. And you set out all the you know, um, animal performance, performance, total dry matter, grind, all those kind of targets as well. But uh, what's the saying? Um, culture, culture trumps strategy. So you've got to get the right people first and the right culture before you can start doing that detailed stuff. Otherwise, the assholes will just derail any of that stuff. What's, what's your age demographics of your staff and how do you track, say, millennial residents and older guy, you know? So we've got different needs. We've got a couple of people just out of high school. <coughs> so they're on four days on, three days off. And they are the rate. And then we've got 60-year-old guys, 67-year-old guys, really high-quality farmers, but they don't want to work 50 hours a week. They only want to work 20 hours a week. So they come in and do 20 hours. Hugely valuable as leaders and just these skills. Uh, and then you've got your everything in between, males and females. So it's about finding the good productive people with skills and then working out how it fits in their life and then bringing them into your teams. So I kind of, kind of think that uh, New Zealand agriculture uh, needs high quality people. We can't survive and keep going forward the way that we've been going over the last 20 years. So this is kind of my attempt at trying to influence that. So I've set up this Facebook page and website. So some of your old guys on Facebook, 60 year olds. <laughs> so, part, so part of this is um, we, everyone wants to know what millennials want. So we're having a pilot in Palmerston North late June. We get 20 uh, odd people under 25 that are working on farms. And we spend a weekend with them trying to work out what they want and how they would run farms. So. We'll, and then if that's successful, we'll run that through the country. But this is my hobby to help, try and help New Zealand agriculture. Just for having all these good quality people, do you don't run into too many issues with too many chiefs and companies? No. No, there's a difference between being a leader and being a manager. So you can have high quality people still in leadership roles, and you still have managers. And remember, it's a really flat structure. So there's an ability to have communication to get the best out of your team. It's not, it's not about one person on the farm making all the choices. It's about the team making the best choice. And then having really strong culture around feedback, the ability to have communication between people. So I guess there's a bit more here if we can get it, maybe. No? Um, you mentioned that you do some no resistance, they're all really excited about it, a little bit dubious at the start, but then they love it. Um, it's just the four elements, well, it's, you know, the four quadrants, might be four um, birds, it's all the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and how then the results, are they, you know, everyone knows what everyone else is? So. Yeah. yeah, then you have, uh, you put up on the sheet wall, uh, I'm Freddie, this is what I, this is my personality and this is how I want to be talked to. I want to be direct to the facts straight away. Well, this guy over here is, I want to be nice and quiet and respectful. Uh, so everyone understands each other better. How much time we got? <coughs> About 10 minutes. So, so this is our culture document. So this is the key way that I describe to everyone what our culture is. And it's changing all the time. And it's probably taken me eight years to write it. It started, um, the very first bit was, uh, we're professional. That's where it started. And also, it said, uh, some people in the audience will get it, it says, kiss OB, which was, keep it simple, Stuart, and OB. <laughs> so I took that off. 
Uh, so we're a professional and every day we make it better. So that's talking about the standard and we're always trying to make it better. Uh, health and safety, that's come in more recently. There's no point in coming to work and getting hurt. And then care for our cows, that's all about looking after our animals. So it's professional, don't get hurt, we look after our animals. We put animals before profit. And then innovate to succeed, it's about ideas, because we're on a sandy soil and it's a bit different. We're still trying to work out how to do it really well. So it's about innovation, it's really important. So I want ideas from everyone. And then we trial it, and then we review it, and then we decide whether we do it again. Uh, celebrate success and failure. So this is about creating a safe environment. If we want people to try new things, we've got to make it safe. So if they make a mistake, we go, yeah, that's all right, we learned, don't worry. How do we do it better? And also, if we have a success, we've got to remember to go, yeah, that was awesome. Um, we adapt to change qu quickly. Everything's changing. So some people like the farm to be the same all the time. Uh, but uh, we're always changing things. So if you want things to be the same, you've got to go somewhere else. Feedback makes it happen. That's what I was talking to you about before. So that's saying that it's everyone's responsibility to give the other person feedback. If they're pissed off about it, you've got to tell them. They're not going to improve if you don't tell them. So it's a responsibility to give people feedback. And we train people to, to be able, so they're able to do that successfully without become, becoming too tedious or angry. Team game, the flat structure, you know, no one's more important than the team. That's getting away from those managers that sit in the house and don't want to work. You know, they've done a hard job, so I'm going to sit in the house. Those guys get dismissed. We don't want those people. Uh, keep it simple. Lots of people, it's got to keep it simple. So we're kind of mid-range systems, pasture-based rather than really intensive cropping. Every, this is a key one. Everyone is 100% responsible for what they do. So that's everyone I dismiss. That's the key thing that makes them all the same. They're not taking responsibility for their actions. They keep blaming their dog, their sister, someone else, and then they do it again, and then they do it again and they get dismissed. So take responsibility for your actions. And that's how you improve. Uh, There's a safe place to work, so have the courage to say it. I added that one in like six months ago. I couldn't work out why this team was having so much issues. There was all this noise and Everyone's frustrated and complained and angry. And then finally it came out that a couple of them were having an affair. Everyone knew about it, but no one told me. If they told me about it, I could have done something about it, but eventually it blew up. I kind of said, why didn't you tell me? But it helped you. So have the courage to say it, and then yeah, that's how good productive people. And I guess the other part of it is, this just describes what type of farmer we are. So our people come first, because we're 30 people. Uh, then our animals, and then it's about profit, which we include innovation in the environment. And we put that before just straight production, and then R&M development's the last thing, because every farm is different. Some farmers like a beautiful, tidy farm, and that's their main motivator. Other people just want cash, profitability, that's their main motivator. And other people just want really fat stock, beautiful stock. So it's about kind of understanding what sort of farmer you are, and then when people come to work for you, you're able to communicate and articulate that to them. So then you're getting the best, the people that agree with you come and work for you. You don't get that conflict and tension later. So that's kind of me. Any, any other questions? So, so what are you going to do? Throw something back at me. What are you going to change? Negotiated later. Nice. If he doesn't perform, how can you fire him? You can't convince him. 
What's that? If he does it before. If he does it before, how are you putting me on the road? I uh, said so that, yeah, so the thing with performance under the law, the employment law that we've got now, is you need to retrain them and then you need to monitor their performance. And if they still aren't doing very well, you have to retrain them again and then monitor their performance and then give them a written warning. So what I'm saying to you is deal with the behaviour of the person. Deal with how they're acting. So they either leave or you'll be able to dismiss them around how they behave. So your employment contracts are largely centred around um, dealing with behaviours as opposed to dealing with skills and... Yeah. The skills can be taught, yeah. but behaviour can't be taught. Really hard to... Once they're 17, 18 years old, almost impossible to change them. That was the other mistake I used to do. I used to try and change people. Hard work. Right, thanks for listening, guys. Mm -hmm.